Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third lecture of this course. Uh, when I again thank Professor Lees, and um, we are happy to have here with us sharing the session, uh, Judge from Henda from Rio de Janeiro, and currently visiting researcher at the Harvard Law School. So, welcome. Very nice to see you again. Professor Lise, go ahead. Bom dia. Uh, so today I wanted to talk about dispute systems design. Is this, is dispute systems design a topic that you discuss a lot in Brazil? Yes? Okay, so um, in the United States, dispute systems design is kind of an emerging topic. Um, it's been around for a while, but we are changing the way that we are thinking about dispute systems design. And we are kind of incorporating ideas from other disciplines um, for thinking about dispute systems design. And to some extent thinking, you know, maybe importing topics from business um, to try and think about dynamic systems and um, think about them in a more complex way and understand how uh, dispute systems change over time and how it's important to think about the way dispute systems are actually used by the people involved rather than just having academics design systems in a very abstract way without really understanding um, how those systems are used um, and adapted over time. So I will give you um, a number of examples um, from both inside and outside the legal um, the legal context to think to provide a framework for thinking about how systems work and how we can adapt those systems principles um, to the ADR context. So um, I'm just going to do a little bit of review first of what we already have talked about this week uh, to provide a frame over how we are going to talk about the question of dispute systems today. So um, we have already talked this week about some of the outside forces that act upon ADR. So how the justice system influences the way ADR works. So that's one systems way of thinking about it. And we'll talk about that a little more. Um, so remember when I was talking about small claims court mediation, um, that's a good example of how um, a dispute system can have a flawed implementation. It might seem like a good idea. It might seem um, theoretically good, but when you look at the way the system actually works, it's not as effective as we might like. Um, and part of that is because of the way the limits of the judicial system, but part of it might be how did we actually design the system, the ADR system to work in small claims court? And at the end, we'll talk about, is there a better way, looking at this spe system specifically, is there a better way to design ADR in small claims court so that it works more effectively? Um, because so far in, in this course this week, we have treated dispute systems as fixed. And we've talked about all of the other things that affect dispute systems. And today we're gonna talk about how to change those systems in a way to better adapt to the way that people use them. Um, and so here's another example, which we talked about how litigation is very expensive. So that, there's an example of how um, there are barriers to accessing the system. And thinking about the barriers to accessing a system is also important for evaluating whether that system works well um, and how to design a better system. And remember when we were talking about the Netflix arbitration contract that corporations use to divert people from litigation, individual consumers or individual employees. Um, so that's an example of how corporations can co-opt a dispute system to work for their benefit. Or this is also an example of how corporations design systems in a way that benefits them. And so um, one of the things that's important that's important when you think about dispute systems design is who are all of the stakeholders involved in this dispute? And 
help, helping each of those stakeholders be involved in the design of the dispute rather than this situation where only the corporations design the dispute and the other people who are affected, like the consumers or the employees, don't get a say in how the dispute system works and predictably are not very well served by that system because they, they were not consulted or involved in designing it. And of course, yesterday when we were talking about um, the arbitration system in the United States and the arbitration system in Japan, that is an example about how cultural forces shape the way um, a dispute system is designed, but also the way it changes over time and the way it is implemented. Okay, so any questions so far? No? Okay. So, um, like I said, thus far this week, we have, we have treated dispute systems like something that is fixed. And today we're gonna talk about these systems as something that is dynamic and how do you change the way or design the way they are operated. Um, Nevertheless, I, I still think it's important to continue to think about all of the forces, the outside forces that act upon a dispute system, because if you don't take those into account, your, de your design is not gonna be very good. And one of the mistakes that American ADR scholars have made in the past in designing systems is they didn't take all of those other factors into account, the institutional factors, the justice system, power differences, which we've talked about a lot this week, um, cultural differences, and how those things affect the, your dispute systems design. If you don't think about all of those factors when you're designing it, your system is going to be flawed. So these outside factors still matter, but we're also gonna think about how can you change and modify the system. Okay, the next thing I am going to talk about is the, old, the older scholarship on dispute systems design. Um, to better understand that. And of course, the person we have to thank most for the early scholarship on dispute systems design is Professor Frank Sander. So Professor Frank Sander wrote this um, article that he really liked to use called Fitting the Fuss to the Forum. And I, this is probably not adequate, this is not uh, respectful enough to Professor Sander, so I'm sorry Professor Sander, for comparing his model to a children's activity books so do you okay so do, um are these do they have these children's activity type books in in brazil okay so the idea is and i don't this one actually doesn't make any sense because it's like okay how do you know that this girl wants the cupcake how do you get this one right i guess you just this activity is just about following the line to their cupcake so so it so Professor Frank Sanders' model was really about matching the dispute to the optimal system. So remember, I think maybe on Monday, I showed you that grid that Professor Sander had where he assigned points to the different attributes of the dispute, and then he described different processes and he gave different points to those. And so the idea was that you would match the dispute system to the attributes of the conflict and then develop the optimal dispute system. But of course, the problem with that way of thinking was his, his assessment occurred in a vacuum and it did not consider how are people using this. It did not involve consulting the stakeholders about what they wanted to do. It didn't think about the systemic factors or the imbalances of power or the legal endowments that might influence the way the system works. So, so it might sound really good scientifically and it might sound really good in theory but in practice, it might not actually work very well. So this is my a diagram of basically the older model of dispute systems design, which is that you're just, you have a, one type of dispute and the experts say, well, this type of process is the best for this type of dispute. So, and I can give you a bunch of examples of how this old model would have been applied. Um, so one um, dispute, a uh, process that was very popular that Roger Fisher popularized is called the, the one text process. Are you familiar with the one text process? Is that something you've talked about here? It might, it might be called something different, but one text process is the idea where the mediator holds the document. So usually this, this was a very common process for like international disputes where you're trying to negotiate over a treaty. 
And the idea is the mediator would have like a proposed treaty for two countries that are trying to decide a trade agreement. And Roger's idea, which worked pretty well in a number of conflicts that he mediated, was he would come up with a proposal and then he would go and the, the sides would, the, he would go to each side and he would say, here's my proposal. Please tell me what you think is wrong with my proposal. And he would use the criticism from each side to improve the proposal. So he would ask, you know, Ecuador. Hmm? One at a time. So short shuttle mediation, but not always shuttle mediation, but that generally shuttle mediation. So he would go to Ecuador and he would say, what is wrong with this proposal? And Ecuador would say this, 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 and this, and Roger would fix it up. And then he would go to Peru and he would say, here's the new proposal. What do you think of this? And Peru would say, well, these five things are wrong with your proposal. And then he would fix it up more. And then he would go back to Ecuador and say, how about this? And he would just go back and forth until both sides couldn't think of anything that was wrong with it. And then at the end of it, this was the idea that you would have something that both sides would like. This was his process. So um, if you're using the matching game, his, his you know, argument was that uh, thorny international dispute that's a really good match for, you know, a one text process, right? And it was, it was this sort of the theoretical attributes of the dispute, you match it up. Um, so likewise, restorative justice has largely been viewed as a very good means for uh, criminal context. So um, as I said earlier this week, restorative justice in the United States in the past has mostly been viewed as a situation for when, you know, uh, someone has engaged in criminal activity and they want to have a process for the person who is engaged in wrongdoing to apologize. Restorative justice gives them a chance to apologize and atone and gives the victim a chance to forgive and everything will be better. So again, it's this idea that, oh, if you have a criminal case, but only if the criminal actor is remorseful, then you match it up and restorative justice, that's perfect. It's a perfect match. This is the perfect process for you. If you have a criminal situation, you should use restorative justice. Um, in um, traditional um, US uh, scholarship, there was also this idea that facilitative mediation is the perfect process for um, difficult community disputes involving many different parties that disagree and have different interests and different power. The best process for that is facilitative mediation because it gives a chance for everyone to say what they think and gives a mediator a chance to consider many different uh, needs of different stakeholders. And so they would recommend facilitative mediation for a community dispute with a local park. Or um, shuttle mediation, if they match it up, the American traditional ADR would say, oh, if there's two parents, they don't get along. They don't want to be in the same room. So the best process for them is to use shuttle mediation. So sh is that a term you use here? Oh, oh sh okay. So sh so shuttle in the United States, shuttle is a term for like a bus, like a shuttle bus. And so shuttle mediation is the idea is the mediator is like the bus. So the mediator gets, so they go, there's one side in one room, the mediator talks to them and then the mediator is the bus and they go to the next room and the mediator talks to the other side and the neither party ever talks to each other. The mediator goes back and forth. So shuttle mediation is good when the parties don't get along in sort of the American theoretical, you know, academic community, they recommend shuttle mediation. So again, we're in the sort of historical, typical academic approach in the United States is you just match these processes to the perfect one and you're good and you're done. And then the, and then the, um, you know, the academic can go home and go back to their other projects and they never stop to think about whether this process is actually good, whether people want this process and whether it's working well, it's just a very perfect matching game. Don't you feel good? Because A goes with three. Um, the more um, recent American scholarship has been focused on um, systems thinking. And this, I think, is primarily from other disciplines and is used a lot in business, but also other disciplines. And I should confess that this is not my core area of expertise. And my colleague, Jen Reynolds, is actually more of an expert on systems thinking and systems design. Um, 
So if you want to know, if you want a deeper dive on systems thinking, I'm sure we could arrange for her to give a Skype talk or something. But so I'll just give you like a brief taste. And if you want more, we can arrange for more depth in the future. Um, so systems thinking is the idea that dis disputes are dynamic and they change over time. And the way that people use the system is not necessarily what you would predict. Um, and, and so you need to think about it in a dynamic way and constantly measure and evaluate and improve the system. So this is also um, similar to what I was talking about yesterday in terms of like the Kaizen model. That too is another example of thinking about what the stakeholders want and how they use it and incorporating their knowledge and preferences in the way you design it and incorporating their knowledge and preference in the changes you make to the system over time. Um, so, you know, in my mind, many of these different bullet points are sort of describing the same thing, which is just the idea that systems are dynamic and change um, and used in ways you don't expect. Questions so far? Okay. Oh, you have a question? No. Okay. So I'm going to give you a few examples about how the way that we design thing, about how the way people use systems may not be what we would predict, and that it's important to consider how systems are used. And these are not in the dispute context. So one example of systems is the way that roads are designed. And actually, if you, if you talk to experts in designing roads, some of their insights are not, or some of their insights make sense and some are actually not as obvious. So um, I guess, which of these two roads do you think is more safe for pedestrians? <laughs> what, what do you think? The left one. Why do you think, why do you think the left one is more safe? Yeah. Yeah. What else? Yes. Okay. So having a crosswalk makes a difference because it's a sign for the motorists to stop. Yeah. Well, yes. Why do you think the car speed is lower? Yes, that's right. The narrow streets. How did you know this? Are you an expert in these? <laughs> so one of the things I learned when I read a little bit about the way that traffic is designed is that cars slow down when the street is more narrow. And so one of the ways to help protect, protect pedestrians in these crosswalk areas is to have narrower streets. Um, and so these multi-lane highways, obviously, in addition to the speed limits, um, the fact that there's many, many lanes actually is a, is a visual cue to the people who are driving that they can go faster. So the many lanes plus um, you know, the wider lanes sends an implicit signal to the driver that they can go faster. So actually the, the reason I learned this was there was a blog written by a traffic expert uh, after a, um, a, a child was hit crossing the street in Texas. And people said, well, this is just the fault of the driver because the speed limit in the, um, in the place where the child was hit was a pretty low speed limit. And so the expectation was if the speed limit is you know, 30 kilometers an hour that the drivers would drive 30 kilometers an hour. But what the traffic expert said was, even though the speed limit was low, the subtle cues about the way the road is designed is sending a message to the drivers that makes them feel like they can drive faster. Um, and so what, what you actually saw was a multi-lane road like that with a crosswalk in the middle. But even though there was a crosswalk and even though the sign said to drive slowly, the visual cues in the environment sent a different message to the drivers that they could go fast because there were many lanes and the lanes were wide. And so what the um, traffic expert recommended was something more like the other one where the lanes were a lot narrower and there was only one lane at a time. And um, I guess this is a, uh, the medians in the middle are also safer for pedestrians because it gives them an opportunity to stop and and make an, a second decision about whether it's safe to go. So it might be safe to go the first time, but then you want to, it gives them an opportunity to make a second one or to hide or protect themselves in case one of the, the driver in the second lane is being dangerous.
Okay, so here's another example of people using um, a design in a way that is, this is hard to see, I'll, I will explain. Um, this is actually based on some research that I did on the design of timekeeping software. So I will, I will um, explain this in a little bit. This might be a, a problem that you have that's a little bit similar in Brazil, which is, th this is known as wage theft in the, in the United States. Wage theft is when um, a worker performs the work, but is not paid for the work. So for example, and this, this is what I saw um, very commonly in my research. Let's say you arrive at your job at 8.55 in the morning and you're supposed to start at nine, but you start five minutes early. Um, and let's say that you also stay until 5.05, .05, so you stay five minutes late. So you've worked more than eight hours. Um, you have worked eight hours and 10 minutes. Well, what happens is the employers structure their software so the software doesn't pay you for the extra 10 minutes. The software only pays you for arriving at nine and leaving at five, even though the software knows very accurately that you arrived at 8.55 because the way the software is structured is you log in in the morning to your job. So you might put in your handprint, you might put in your code, you might log into your computer to tell you you've arrived and started work. But the software is structured to, to be inaccurate and to pretend like you only arrived at nine for very complex legal reasons. Um, but the other problem is the way the software is designed is it makes it very easy for managers to change the time that you entered in the software itself. And so what I discovered when I looked at the way that the software is designed is that it's very easy for the manager to change it and the software sends subtle clues to the manager that it's okay to change people's time. So even though it's illegal to change someone's time, the software makes people think that it's okay to change, sort of like the design of the highway makes you think it's okay to drive fast, even if the sign says drive slowly. Even if your company says you're not allowed to change people's time, the software sends the message, maybe it's okay. So here's an example of um, how that happens. So you probably can't read this very well. This is a screenshot of software for timekeeping in the United States. And one of the interesting things is there is a button that you might be not be able to read that says edit. Okay, edit um, in the United States has a very specific meaning that might be hard to translate. Edit means change in a way that makes it better or revise. So like, it, like if you're writing a, a, like if you're writing your thesis, you have a first draft and then you edit it and then you have a second draft. And so the idea, the, the implicit message when you use the word edit is that you are improving their time. You are making their time better. Well, that suggests to the manager that maybe you are making their time better by changing it because, you're a, because the software says, hey, look how easy it is to just press the edit button and then you can tell the software, you know what, this person, uh, this person shouldn't have arrived early. I told them not to arrive early and that was wrong. So I'm just going to edit their time by pressing the edit button and the software is structured to allow the manager to edit someone's time. And so if they arrived early and I think that was a bad idea, I'll press edit and they won't be paid because I, the manager can pay it. And the design of the software suggests that's okay. The other subtle message that you see in some of the software, and you can sort of see this here, it might be hard to tell. Sometimes they have a button that the manager can press that has like a pencil or a feather that suggests, you know, again, and you're fixing it, it's okay to change it. I'm just, and you just press the button and the pencil button or the feather button and you just fix their time, right? Um, or they have a cursor. What's the word for cursor in Portuguese? Yeah, so they have a cursor where the manager just types in the new, fixed, improved time. And the, the problem with the message that it sends when you put a cursor in for them to just type in the new time is it suggests that it can be edited 
and it sends a message to the manager that maybe when you're editing it, it deletes the old entry and that there is no detection of the original time the person entered. When in fact, the computer software actually does record the original time entry, but the problem is it sends a, a message, a cue to the manager that you're overwriting and replacing the original, the original entry, just sort of like you're changing a Word document and editing it, right? So the subtle cues and even the choice of the button, the word on the button, the picture associated with the button, those are all subtle messages that influence the way the system is used. So again, when we're thinking about how to design software or how to design a dispute resolution system, you have to think about what messages does this send to the people who are gonna use it and how are they actually gonna use it and study how they actually use it and how they might misuse it. So this is the worst example I saw for software. Um, this is a tech company who has a system where you can change an employee's time by just moving your, moving your mouse to the right or the left on the blue bar. So this, so this might be the time the employee actually logged in, but you can just change it by moving the blue bar one way or another, okay? So here's my question for you. How do you think managers might be tempted? What messages does this send to a manager about how to handle an employee's time. It's up to me, yeah, what else? Definitely it's up to me. What other messages does it send to a manager, do you think? Hmm? I can do whatever I want, yep. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yes. I mean, it also sends other even uh, very subtle messages, like you're not taking away someone's time. You're just like lining it up. You know, you're lining it up. Oh, it's not quite on the, it's not quite on the hour. I, this doesn't look good. It doesn't look straight. I'm just going to fix it. It will look much nicer if I line it up visually, right? It kind, so this system kind of provides a visual reward to the managers for making a change because then it looks nicer because it's lining up with the lines and it's so easy to do, right? So another thing that you see with misconduct in this situation is the easier it is to do and the more it looks like it's okay to do, the more people will be tempted to engage in this bad behavior because it seems like you're doing something good by lining it up, it looks more organized. If you're a very organized person, I'm just fixing this, I'm making it nice, right? And you know, the, the, the other thing I find so outrageous is they have a picture of like a boy on a slide. Like this is, it is your job to line up the, line up the time and isn't this fun? This is fun to do and you should do it and it makes managing time easier. And, and the other thing that drives me absolutely crazy is even after I published this paper with this screenshot of the child on the slide saying it's easy and fun, do you see it says it's fun? They even, it's still on their website. They didn't change it. So I, so apparently I didn't embarrass them enough to even change the picture of the boy on the slide. So this is upsetting to me. Some of the other, some of, actually some of the other software makers after I published this paper fixed their software, but this one was, I think, still proud of lining up the, lining up the time. Okay, so again, think about how the design affects the way people use it. Any questions? for time okay okay so this is the so if you look at the theory um and um there's a there's some good there's a couple of good books on dispute systems design so these are the stages they recommend in the book on systems design um and i think i had it in the reading list i think i think it's nancy rogers robert bardone and one other person wrote a pretty good book on dispute systems design um so these are the these are the stages Okay, so let's start with the planning stage. So um, these are the, some of the initial questions that I think you should ask. So what are the systems that are already in place that influence how this dispute is resolved? I think the mistake that so many American scholars made in the earlier scholarship on dispute systems design is to assume there is no system in place. And that's just wrong. I mean, any dispute you have now in the world, there is already a system in place to handle it. 
It might be a bad system. It might be a dysfunctional system, but it's already there. And you're not going to start from scratch. And if you ignore all the other things that are already in place that influence how these disputes are resolved, you're not going to you're going to miss important aspects of it. So the first thing to, to ask is what systems are already there for resolving this, this dispute. Um, and what other outside factors might affect the way this dispute is resolved um, that, that are outside of your control, or maybe that you might be able to change a little bit. Yeah. So who are the key stakeholders and how are they resolved? So here's an example, and again, this is not my core area of expertise, so I apologize to all of my colleagues at Oregon when I, and all of the water law scholars when I get this wrong. Um, so this was um, a thesis that one of my graduate students did um, on groundwater. Um, and I actually have another colleague, Adele Amos, who specializes in, in water disputes, but um, Anyways, this was from one of my students. So groundwater, I don't know if, is this a term that you have in Portuguese? Groundwater is a special kind of water. In the United States, they sometimes call groundwater fossil water. And they call it fossil, you know, like dinosaurs, they call it fossil water because it does not replace, it, it, it doesn't replace. It's, once it's gone, it doesn't come back very quickly. It comes back very, very slowly. And it's deep in the ground. Okay, so in the United States, we have a lot of, Okay. Yeah. So in the United States, we have a lot of difficult uh, disputes around groundwater because it is a scarce resource. Okay. So let's say you were doing a dispute systems design uh, over groundwater. What might be all of the different factors that influence how that dispute is currently resolved? So I'll tell you what the American ones are, and then maybe you can tell me in Brazil what the factors might be for influencing how the dispute is resolved. So the biggest issue that you have to take into account in Oregon is what are the laws currently for how that groundwater is allocated. And I'm, gonna, I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong, but in the United States, we have a very complex state and federal hierarchy for how water, scarce water is allocated. So there are various permits associated with the water. Um, so there might be agricultural permits for water. There might be tribal rights to the water. The local municipality might have rights to the water. Um, the federal government and the state government might regulate how the, that water is allocated and changed over time. So there's the existing legal structure and the market allocation of the water. So in any, so she, so my um, student looked at groundwater in a particular county. All those things are going to influence um, the way water is currently allocated and the, your ability to actually change the way the, the future allocation is. Um, the other, the other um, issue you have to take into account is how do people actually behave vis-a-vis -vis the water? So one of the problems that you see for people who have competing water rights for groundwater is that the, the deeper your well, the easier it is to access the water. But also, I guess I'm not a water expert, the water bends towards the deeper well. And so what happens is this person with the shallow well might have started out by having okay access to groundwater, but if their neighbor digs even deeper wells, not the, the water all goes to the deeper wells and the neighbor who is supposed to get water doesn't get any water, right? So, so you don't wanna just think about what are the legal allocations of the water, but how is the behavior affecting their existing behavior and their gamesmanship affecting the distribution of the scarce resource. Um, and then anytime you're designing a, an improved dispute or an improved uh, consultation process for something like water, you also want to take into account um, how, how are disputes resolved informally? So there may be a formal system for allocating water, but how do these neighbors actually behave when water becomes scarce? It may be there's a formal legal process for them to fight about whether that one neighbor's well is too deep, but it's possible that, you know, the neighbors see each other at the local store and they talk about how much water they need and they negotiate over how deep their well is going to be. Or maybe they talk about all oh, you, oh, you can have some of my water, or maybe they meet at the local store and just have an angry argument, you know, but 
Um, it's important to understand what the unwritten rules are and the unwritten norms are around how this dispute is resolved, because if you don't take that into account, the system you're going to design is not going to be correct. Because if you, if you ignore how the farmers actually like to behave, you might design a perfect system, but then the farmers are still going to negotiate at the local store. Um, and that might either you either work with your system. Ideally, you want it to work with your system um, as opposed to working against the system that, that you devise. So do you have a similar system for water disputes in Brazil? Hmm. Okay. And they are saying that it's tourists. Okay. People use it to waste, uh, to waste water, waste. No, not waste, but just for infrastructure purpose. Yeah. But it's a very mm. good water, and they have like a big well. I'm like uh, the level, and that uh, comes down to the, the farmer. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. So the other thing we have in Oregon, and I'm, I might be wrong, it, but one of the things we have in Oregon is sometimes if you have a water right, if you don't use the entire water right, you lose that water right. And so you also have the system of people, even if they don't really need the water this year for their farm, they still want to use all the water because maybe they want it next year. Or the water right might be even more valuable than their entire farm. And so sometimes you see companies who are buying up land, not because they want the land, but, but they want the water right associated with that property. So you see this gamesmanship where they don't even want the water or need the water a particular year, but they use it up to maintain their water right. And then the, so the resource gets depleted, right? So part of fixing the whole system might involve changing this use it or lose it system where you have to use the water right or else you might lose it. Or else you, you use the entire water right, but you give it to your neighbor. I mean, that you sell the residual, that might be a little bit more efficient. But you know, that's why, that's why in the United States, one of the things we've seen when it comes to dispute resolution and dispute systems design, increasing involvement of subject matter experts. So if I was to go in and try and help them with their water dispute, I would, I would probably not be very helpful because I'm not an expert on water. And because the system is so complex, if you have an expert who is not an expert on the actual subject matter, or you don't involve experts who are knowledgeable about both the local customs, like a local expert on behavior, but also like the legal, like the law of that particular domain, and maybe also the science of how the, about how the water works. If you don't have all of those people at the table when you're designing a system, probably you're gonna get it wrong. So in the United States, we've really seen a trend towards specialization in dispute resolution where, where the people who are helping on the dispute are really experts on this particular area because we've seen it not working very well if you, if you don't have the subject matter expertise for managing the problem. Any questions? Uh, yes. I would like to ask one question. And my field of research is labor and employment law. And here in Brazil, we have a problem because like 50% of the lawsuits are about compensation, <coughs> sorry, compensation pay. <coughs> and sometimes it's only like mathematics. And yes how to design and develop an ADR system to this kind of issue. Mm. Because we have like more than 1 million cases. And this is like mathematics mm. because uh, sometimes people are dismissed without just cause mm -hmm. and the employers the, uh, don't pay the proper compensation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they bring suits. Mm. How can we develop an ADR system for that? And avoiding mm -hmm. frauds because uh, mm -hmm. Here, we are really worried about frauds mm -hmm. in ADR for mm. these kind of issues. Mm. I, I answer. Sure, thank you. So, no, just a, a point. I, I think the first question is, what do you want to achieve? What is the goal, the purpose? What do you want to 
because now people are really worried about numbers because oh we have like one million and five hundred thousand lawsuits about this and it's expensive for the state mm -hmm. uh, to pay so many judges mm -hmm. to try to conciliate and to resolve this kind of mm -hmm. issues and mm -hmm. so we are worried uh, mm -hmm. nowadays unfortunately we are worried about budget and so we are trying to develop and you went to our regional labor court here in mm -hmm. sao paulo and they have a, a conciliation center and trying to develop new methods of resolving this kind of issues and but uh how can we do it without a judge uh, without this judge dependence and you know maybe in a, a more informal and simple way this is what the points we are worried about. <laughs> so I, I don't know very much about the Brazilian system, but what I've heard this week is that, is that um, there's a cultural significance. So it's not just about money. There's a cultural significance associated with speaking with a judge and a meaning associated with speaking a judge. And so even if you can get the math right, you would need to design a system that addresses the cultural value and need associated with having a judge involved. So it might be having the judge less involved. So I thought the conciliation system was very interesting because the judge was able to handle eight cases at once, but they weren't in the room at every minute, but they were in the room when they needed to be. I don't know if conciliation is faster. To me, it seemed very efficient to have the parties talking with a mediator and then the judge would just come, come in when they needed. And the judge plays an important, significant cultural role for the people involved and they want to have the judge sign off on their mediation. And so when they need the judge, the judge is there for five minutes. I, th I think that I thought that was very clever and very interesting. One of the ideas of the barter system, the, the worker, even the, the, the most, uh, uh, no, the most poor worker could be able to file a suit against the employer. Mm -hmm. It's a sign of uh, power. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, a, it's the symbolic power, mm -hmm. uh, reference of power mm -hmm. and empowerment of the worker. Mm -hmm. So before the, the judge, before the court. Yeah. Before. Before. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we have that in the United States too. So again, I would ask, uh, what uh, what your focus? You, in, you intend to change it, but what do what, what uh, is the direction of the, of the change? Yeah, because I think that here in Brazil we are trying to design something but we, we don't know how to design mm. a system like an alternative system. And I think we are improving, we are developing, and we are making so many efforts to do that. But sometimes it's really hard to design another system. And mm. in some kind of issues, like mediation is very effective, but sometimes for, for employment issues, mm. uh, as you already saw, uh, sometimes they, they need to see the judge. And I would also like to ask you about this culture of, about uh, giving so much importance to the court system. Because for example, in the US, you have so many movies showing the court system and every time, and I think that I haven't seen a movie yet, like showing uh, yeah, ADR and mediation. Do you have any movie? I, I would like to ask with like a curiosity because oh. I would like to watch. Uh, yes. Yes, there's. And, and I, yes. I tried to. Which one? Oh, sexual harassment. I mean, there's the one that professors like to show in their class, and this is a bad example, and I don't recommend showing this in your class. There is a movie called Wedding Crashers with uh, Owen, what's his name? Uh, I seen that one. It's about the guys who aren't invited to the wedding, who go to other people's weddings and eat all the food. That one. Um, there's a mediation at the start of it, but there's a lot of bad language and the mediator is not effective. But they try to mediate their silly divorce and they fight a lot about how bad the other one is. I mean, here's the thing is like Americans love the symbolism of court, but they cannot afford it. So in the United States, court is like an idea. So actually one of the things, the best way to understand what's happening in the American legal culture is to watch advertisements from lawyers. Because if you look at the advertisements for lawyers and watch them really carefully, what they say is, 
Hello, you should call our law firm. We're the best law firm ever. We will settle your case for a very good number. We are very good at settling your case, right? So they, they say, we will fight for you to get a good settlement. <laughs> so the fighting in reality has been translated into fighting for a good settlement because they know realistically it's going to end in a settlement. And so you see the, even the advertisements now are like, we will fight for a settlement. <laughs> Celia, did you want to say something? Hmm. No. Mm. Mm. So these guys just say, I Patterns have that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 
Yes, so maybe there is a way to have a math component or a software component that somehow ends in the judge saying it's okay. Um, so I thought it was very interesting going to your courts. Um, the use of computers during mediation. I, there does seem to be an aspect of Brazilian culture where you like math and you want the right answer. To an extent you do not see in the United States. So in American mediations, you never see a computer because, well, the American mediation system is, is based on tradition and folk knowledge and, and not really very focused on getting the right answer. And so you never see a computer and they, the mediators always just use paper or they like to put a piece of paper on the wall for everyone to see on the wall, but they always write it by hand. They never use a computer. And as part of this like magical folk knowledge that if you just, in the United States, if you just have your piece of paper or you have your thing on the wall, the people will forge a great connection and they will resolve their dispute. It's not a better way. It's just based on the culture and tradition of American dispute resolution. And so I thought it was very interesting and cool to see the computers in the Brazilian mediation rooms because it's a way for everybody to look at what the numbers are and to talk about what the numbers should be and look at the thing they look at the numbers jointly. And also I was so excited to see there was also a system for the judge to sign off electronically. And there was the electronic notepad where the judge came to the end of the mediation. They have a deal and the judge writes the signature and it goes into the computer system. So I thought that was a great way of having the symbolic that's involvement right. of the judge, but also using technology to make it more efficient. And also in a way that people I think respect and, and, and feel like they have the right number partly because the computer is, I think the computer actually has a symbolic value in these yes. mediations where the computer is also another indicia that you're getting the right answer because it's showing up in the computer in some way, even if the mediator just typed it into the computer. There's some idea <laughs> of, uh, 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 that uh, computers and algorithms uh, bring some neutrality. Yes. So it's a belief, it's a chemical belief that it's a big neutrality. I like that. I like that. I like that cultural aspect. We, I think we could, that would be interesting to have in the United States for sure. Um, our, so we do have computerized court records in the United States, but they're very old. So if you, so for example, you know how airlines have very bad record systems and you, whenever you go to check in, well, maybe this is just in the United States. When you go to check into your flight, they're always, they can't use a mouse. They're pressing tab a million times, typing in, pressing tab, and it takes like 20 minutes. That is the court system in the United States. It's, it's only at the courthouse. You can't access the court file. Well, in federal court, you can access it from home. But for state and local courts, they're very underfunded. It's just a bad computer system from like 1991 that's only available in the courthouse, and you can't use a mouse. You have to press tab. So Brazil, from a computerized standpoint, is their court, your court system is is much further ahead than the um, the American digitized court system. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so here's another example about thinking about dispute systems design, and this is from my colleague Michael Mushino, and this is his recent book, which he spent they fit, actually spent 15 years researching this book, which is amazing. Um, so Michael Mushino and his Michael Mushino is a sociologist, and they spent 15 years uh, doing ethnographic research at a school to better understand how the students in the high school resolve conflict. 
And this was a high, this was a high poverty school actually. And so in the United States for many years in the ADR community, there have been stereotypes about high poverty schools. Ethnographic research. Ethno, yeah. yeah. The, the, the medium. Oh, ethnographic, uh, like qualitative research, like where they're going in and they're interviewing people and, and, and a, a narrative research and asking for people's stories. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in the American system, there have been stereotypes in academia about how high poverty students in high poverty schools resolve conflict. And the assumption has always been that students are not good at resolving conflict, that they are prone to fighting, and that the solution is for the teachers to come in and impose a solution or to have peer mediation pro programs to teach the students how to resolve conflict because they can't do it on their own. Or maybe there's also an unrelated problem, which I'll discuss about having police in the school. So the really interesting research that Michael Mushino did was he looked at how they actually resolved conflict. And he found that the students were very sophisticated at resolving the conflict in their schools. And the way they did that, the way they did it was what he called anchored fluidity, which is a term they made up for that referred to the fact that students used, they moved around in the space of the school as a way to resolve conflict. So for example, if, if, two groups were kind of fighting and getting tense, one of the groups would maybe go over to um, a classroom and, and hang out with a teacher to calm down. Or maybe they would go over to the cafeteria to hang out with their friends and, and, and resolve it. Or maybe they would go and sit next to the lockers for a moment by themselves. And so they used the space and the freedom of movement in the school as a way to address conflict. And the other thing that they discovered was that the older students in the school mentored the younger students and taught them how to resolve conflict. So when the younger students would come into the school, they might be very aggressive and they might be prone to escalating conflict. And the older students would say, hey, hey, you know, calm down. That's not how we do things. Here's what you should do. You should you know, move over there or you should think about it this differently or do nothing until tomorrow and think about it. And so the students themselves had a very sophisticated informal mechanism for handling conflict, which they called trouble. And, and it worked very well. Um, but what um, Professor Machineau found was that, that this system was actually disrupted by the militarization, militarization of schools in the United States. Um, and this school was affected by that. Um, so um, one of the things that happened in American schools in about 2000 is, uh, high poverty schools started to be treated as high security zones and almost kind of like prisons. So they would put up these big gates. Um, they um, would put metal detectors in the school, put lots of fences to make it very hard for students to leave the campus. And this was intended to protect students from outside threats perhaps and or out, outside crime, but also it was, I think, a way to that the students were themselves were perceived as dangerous and a security threat. So in a way it was an, intended to contain the students somehow. And what Mushino and his colleague found was for a period, the militarization of the school increased conflict. And then there was actually, so the October fight refers to one particular instance where there was a huge fight involving eight students. And there were lots of various theories about what had caused it with the blame the students. But when um, Mushino and his colleagues went back to try and investigate and understand what had caused the large fight, it was because the students no longer had freedom of movement within the school. And they could no longer use this system that they had relied upon for years of moving around as a way to diffuse conflict because everything was gated off and fenced off within the school. Um, so the safe schools movement actually made the school less safe for the students inside. Um, However, he found that it improved over time. So over the subsequent decades, students developed new ways of handling conflict and sort of new places to go and new ways to use the space that was like adaptive. And so the, the school is better now, even though the students still continue not to have very much freedom um, in their movement. Questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
Yep. Yes. Yes, I'll, I have another example that I'll show you of the system they're working on right now um, at the School of Education in Oregon. Um, one of the things that I really liked about Mushino's research was that part of what he did was understand the vernacular the words that the students use for their conflict. So for his school, if you walked in and said, tell me about your conflict resolution system, they would be like, we don't know what you're talking about, we don't have one. But what he discovered was the students called their conflicts troubles, right? And so then when he started asking students and they would stay in the school for weeks and watch the students and watch how they talked and how they behaved, how do you handle trouble well, they actually had sort of a menu of things they did to resolve trouble. It just didn't fit within our the way that academics talk about conflict. Um, but they called it trouble. And so, you know, if they, they had sort of transcripts of what the students would say, and then within the way that the students talked about it, they realized that students, you know, would say, oh, you know, that's not a big deal. Like, calm down. That's not how we handle things at the school. And so thinking about how are the students talking about conflict and so engaging with them in the way that they are in the way that they are already handling it. Um, even if it's not always perfect, then you can meet them where they're at and, th and develop a system that that resonates with them. OK, so part of designing a system at the front end is understanding who are the key decision makers. And this is actually a very difficult part of the process. So, I mean, the first thing that people typically do when they're designing these systems is they ask, who are the decision makers in the past? And that's good. Who are the key players? Those people are almost always at the table anyways. But it's also important to think about who are the people who are affected by this outcome, who may not immediately identify themselves or demand to be part of the process, but they're the people who are primarily affected. Um, so in the school system, it would be the students themselves, it might be the teachers, it would be the school administrators, and maybe also the parents. Um, and, you know, frankly, in our American system, unfortunately, it's the police officers as well. So you would need to involve the police officers, unfortunately. So thinking about who is always going to be affected by the way that you design this system. Um, and then one of the things that's hard for groups that are typically not represented at the table is thinking about who um, is going to represent them and who 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 is an adequate representative and um, not necessarily just going with who identifies themselves as a representative but who's who does the community say represents their point of view um, and who would the community respect their value and maybe having multiple representatives for a particular set of community stakeholders the other um, difficult question is 
Do you invite to the table people who have the ability to disrupt the process? So again, these people wouldn't normally be invited, but you can anticipate that when you start rolling out the process, they'll find a way to disrupt it. And so it might be better to have them at the table in the first place and have them involved and have them on the outside disrupting the process later on, even if it makes the negotiations harder when you're first designing the system, because at least you know what their objections are. Um, there may be an additional group of people who don't want to be at the table, who don't want to negotiate, but want to know what's happening and feel it's important to be consulted or informed. And that might address their concerns and needs simply to be informed of what's happening, even if they're not making a decision. Um, here is the other problem, which is called process loss. So I will tell you a story about Roger Fisher. So Roger Fisher had this saying that he always said a million times, which he called ABC. And this was his philosophy, which was always consult before deciding. So I guess that's ACD, ACBD, ACBD. Always consult before deciding. He was obsessed about this. He would say this all the time. His wife had a different opinion. So his wife, his wife's name was Carrie. She was very funny. So, so Roger would say A, B, D, C or whatever. And uh, Carrie would say N, G, A, D, which stands for never get anything done. Because <laughs> she said, if you all consult all the time, you'll never make a decision. You'll never do anything. This is not a practical way to go about your life. So, um, you know, you have to have a trade-off between who are you going to include and like how long is this process going to take and you know the more people you have at the table um the harder it is and so in social psychology we call this process loss which is the more people involved the more difficult it is um and so this is actually from a from a funny social science study um there's this concept in social science called social loafing and social loafing is that you don't work as hard when there are other people also working on the problem. And uh, they measured this by telling people to scream into a microphone as loudly as they could. And so they would say, all right, you're gonna scream by yourself, scream as loudly as you can. And then they would measure how loud the scream was. Then they would tell people, you're gonna scream as part of a group. Please scream as loud as you can. And what would happen was if they thought they were screaming with other people, they did not scream as loud. So they would measure people who thought they were screaming with others, the volume would go down. And the more people um, that they thought were screaming with them, the less loudly they shouted. So it was an example, of, and they've seen this in other um, uh, you know, experiments, like when they ask you to pull on a rope, if they think other people are helping you pull the rope, you don't pull as hard. So this is the idea that people don't try as hard. But there's also something known as like process loss or coordination loss, which is just the more people you have, the more people people you have to consult and the more slowly things happen. I'm sure this happens to you at work. If you have many people in a meeting, the meeting goes on and on, you don't get as much done. It might've been better to have three people at the meeting than six people. So that's the trade-off. You know, you, you want to include people who might be spoilers, but it will take longer. Um, so he, so so one of the examples I like from international conflict is just President Trump, who is always like his own spoiler. So this is the constant problem with President Trump is is if he's not actually at the bargaining table, and sometimes even when he is at the bargaining table, he will disrupt his own process, right? So the problem with the negotiations with North Korea, they really wanted Trump to be at the table. And the reason they wanted to, was partly because there's a lot of status associated with having Trump being there, but they also know that if anybody other than Trump himself is making a deal, they know there's always a possibility that Trump will spoil it and they'll come to a deal and afterwards Trump will say like, no, I, I don't want that. That's, I, I changed my, like not even I changed my mind, but that's not okay with me. Um, and Trump also has a reputation of saying he's okay with something and then at the last minute um, throwing out the whole deal and say, if you don't give me these concessions, all bets are off. And of course, in the negotiations with China over trade, he even when he's not at the table, he finds ways to spoil it. So for example, even while the, the, tra even while the trade negotiation systems are going on, he'll just say on Twitter, oh, I'm imposing tariffs. 
right? So he's just sort of, he's acting as a spoiler in his own negotiations. He's doing all these things from the outside. Oh, I won't let Huawei like do any business in America anymore. It has nothing to do with negotiations. He's just putting pressure on it from the outside, right? So he's a stakeholder that if he's not at the table, it becomes problematic, even though it's his own table. Okay, this is, I think, the last example I want to give. It's kind of a long example. So this is an example of a dispute system that um, has been implemented in the United States to try and address the problem of uh, racial disproportionality in school discipline. And I will explain what that is. In American schools, African-American kids are disciplined by their teachers and referred for discipline, like being suspended from school, like you can't go to school, or being kicked out of the school entirely um, at a much higher rate than their counterparts who are white. And when you look at the data, the much higher rate of exclusion and discipline is not, you can't explain it based on the student's behavior. And here's why. Um, there are subjective ways of, of, of a student engaging in misbehavior and objective ways. So an objective, an objective misbehavior by a student might be something like truancy, you didn't go to school, right? Or bringing a weapon to school, that's an objective offense. Everyone can agree there's not much dispute over whether the bad behavior has occurred. Um, that's actually not where the sharp rise in discipline is from. The very high rate of discipline and exclusion of African-American students is from subjective discipline by the teachers. So a subjective, a subjective in, uh, infraction would be something that people might disagree about whether it's, whether it's bad or not. So you were disrespectful, you know, like the student's chewing gum, you were disrespectful, or you, know, the, you were talking out of turn or whatever, that's a subjective infraction. So it's actually the subjective infractions where it's based on, on the teacher's or the principal's judgment about whether this behavior was bad or not. It's the subjective infractions that are, that are accountable for this difference, right? And so what that suggests is the reason African-American and Hispanic students are disciplined at higher rates is because of bias on the part of the people who are making these decisions. That the same behavior by a white girl is interpreted like chewing gum in class, is interpreted very differently when an African-American student engages in the same conduct chewing gum in class. That is, you know, they, they notice the African-American students chewing gum in class and they give them, they send them to the principal's office. The white student doing the same thing, they don't notice, they get a pass. And that is actually the source of the, dis of the disparity. And so, um, uh, American education system has been tracking these disparities and working to try and find ways to, to address them and reduce them. And it's actually been very difficult to reduce the disparities, obviously, because, you know, racism in the United States is a very difficult problem and, you know, firmly entrenched. And, you know, in the United States, there's a lot of unconscious bias. So people are behaving in ways that are measurably biased, but they don't think they're doing anything biased. They don't realize it. They don't acknowledge it. They think they're being equal. But if you look at their behavior, they're not. Um, so this is actually a study, this is part of a study that my colleague, this is my colleague Eric Gervin, you can see him on this study. My colleague Eric Gervin studies racial disproportionality in school discipline. He, my uh, colleague is on the law faculty, but he's also a social psychologist. So he's been working in teams to try and help address the problem. And he's one of the people who is measuring the difference between subjective discipline decisions and objective discipline decisions. Um, one of the things I liked about their research is they actually tried to look even deeper in, in the data to try and figure out what is the situation, what are the situations in which these decisions are being made. And so, and there's actually really good data in the United States for, for this uh, question. So the, one of the first things they discovered in addition to the subjective objective question was that the discipline was occurring in the classroom and not you know, in the hallway, at the entrance to the school or the playground. So it's helpful to know that because then you realize that you don't, you don't necessarily need an intervention for the playground. You need to be looking at, it's actually teachers who are making the decision. So you wanna design a system for addressing this problem that's relating to the, the decisions that teachers are making on an everyday basis. 
When they looked even further down at their data, they found that a lot of the disproportionality or more, more than you would expect were, were decisions that teachers were making at the start of each day. And it's not quite clear why this was and that the, they were especially being very difficult. They were being very hard on African-American girls compared to white girls at the start of the day. So maybe it's because the teachers are frazzled and they haven't had enough coffee in the morning, or maybe it's because they want to set a tone for the start of the day. And then maybe the teachers think if they're not very strict at the start of the day, then there will be a problem. But of course, they're being strict mostly as to the African-American girls. The white girls are not receiving the strict behavior. But it's helpful to know that these decisions are being made in the classroom on subjective infractions at the start of the day, because then you can start to think about what are the in interventions that we could do in that particular situation that would help fix the problem. So some of the interventions they have come up with are um, being more clear with all of the teachers and having clear guidance and talking to the teachers are, what are the standards we are going to use for subjective infractions? So, dis so if you say a student is being disrespectful, let's be a little bit more clear about what being disrespectful means. Part of the reason you want to do that is so that you can communicate with the students ahead of time. Here are the standards for the behavior that we want from you. So it's not a surprise to the students. You're telling them in advance, and so it's easier for the students to conform their behavior. Part of it is also just to let the teachers know, this is where the bias is occurring. You should know that you should be really careful about the decisions you're making in the morning because that seems to be where some of the problem is coming from. Um, and part of it is also maybe telling the students, another option is don't discipline a lot in the morning. It's not really helping you get where you need to go. Maybe in the morning you should be focusing on other things than necessarily sending students to the principal's office because this is where we're seeing a lot of the problem. Um, you know, but I think it's also important when you think about this problem, again, to remember what are all the systemic limits to how this problem is currently resolved. Because in the United States, it's very common for everyone to have an opinion about how teachers should behave because everybody went to school and so they remember their own teachers and they will have advice for their own teachers and how they, they wish their teacher behaved or maybe they love their teacher and they want their teacher to behave differently. But you know, of course, in the United States, our teachers are not paid very well. And also our teachers are heavily regulated, right? So we, so in the, in the American system, we already have so many rules around all of the things a teacher has to cover. You know, we don't have a lot of time in the day for a student to be able to sit down and talk to students and mediate and negotiate because the state guidelines expect the students to cover all of these other things. And so it's a little bit unreasonable to say to teachers, well, you know, this is all your fault and you should fix this entirely on your own and use a lot of class time because there are a lot of other constraints that limit the choices that are available to the teachers. And so being very mindful when you design these systems to involve the teachers in trying to decide what to do because, because they, are, you know, they don't have perfect freedom over how they spend their time and how they manage their classroom. Yes? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. That is part of the system. Yes, I will explain. Um, so this is, I'm sorry, it's so small. And you know, I'm not an expert in education, so I'm not doing this justice. Um, this is a very popular, a very growing movement in the United States. Um, and it's not just related to dispute systems design, but it has a component of dispute systems. And it's called positive behavioral intervention system. And it's, you know, there's a lot of research. The University of Oregon has a very large education department. And they are the ones that have uh, pioneered this system for many years. It's actually a pretty old system and have tested it over time. So there's a lot of empirical evidence in support of it. So, and, and actually the interesting thing is you see them using it in my children's school. So um, one of the um, components of this system is rewarding students for good behavior. Apparently that is one of the best ways to improve student behavior is when you notice them doing something good is give them a reward. So, 
And, and you see this as early as kindergarten. So when my son goes to school and if he does something good, he's not very good at telling me the story. So I'm not really sure what happens at school. But sometimes he comes to school with a happy face written on, on his hand or a star written on his hand, I guess in smelly ink because it, it's like a special reward for it to be sparkly or for it to smell good. So he has a star happy face on his hand. And I say, why do you have that? And he says, the teacher gave it to me for doing something good. And so they have this system of constantly, anytime they see good behavior, constantly rewarding it, you know, even with just something on their hand, so that the student feels good and the student learns what's the good behavior the teacher wants to cultivate. And so they've seen that statewide, so that's why it's called positive behavioral intervention system. It's the whole system is intended to reward and foster positive education. So you can see on the bottom tier, this is the intervention they use for across the school. So uh, being very clear with students about their expectations around behavior, acknowledging great behavior, um, and then also giving students very explicit instruction on social skills and conflict resolution every day as part of the curriculum. So part of how they learn is how to resolve conflict on their own or how to you know, manage their emotions and manage the way they communicate their emotions and manage their behavior. Um, and part of it also involves the teachers and the other um, instructors in the school, the teacher's aides being very vigilant about noticing good behavior. So this is a problem at my house when I, I'm, a, I'm not a very good parent. So this is the problem at my house is that like I'm not really watching my children. So I don't do a very good job of rewarding positive behavior because I'm not really noticing what they're doing. Mostly I'm just, you know, typing on my laptop and they're doing something bad and I start yelling at them. So I'm basically like the opposite of this system. So I'm pretty sure my children behave better in school because they're actively monitoring their behavior. And when they see something good, they say, good job, you get a star in your hand. Um, and so the next level is sort of the more specialized intervention for problems that come up. So the next le level includes a restorative justice component that sounds similar to what you observed. Um, so restorative justice has become very popular in schools and I think it comes in, in various forms and I think it's very important for teachers and schools and communities to adapt the, the restorative justice system to a way that works with their class and how much time they have and how much energy they have. But sometimes restorative justice just means, um, you know, in the morning the students sit in a circle and they talk about how they're feeling today and whether things are going well or going badly. So you have a sense for the student's emotional state in the morning. But the more traditional use of restorative justice in schools is, you know, if something bad happens where a student misbehaves, they have then an opportunity to speak with the student who was affected by the bad behavior or the teacher. So I'm, often the student is the person who's affected by the bad behavior because it was disruptive. And they sit in a circle and um, the teacher or the affected student explains why the behavior was a problem and how it impacted the classroom or the other students. And then the student has an opportunity to apologize or acknowledge that they did this um, bad behavior. And then they talk in a group about how the student is going to make it up to them. So they'll stay after class and help clean up or they apologize or something to make the situation better to resolve it so that the problem is addressed. But that the most important aspect of restorative justice in schools is the student stays in the classroom. Because the history of discipline in school in the United States is the solution used to be the student is out. If you misbehave, you're out. You go to the principal's office and if your behavior is bad enough, you go to the principal's office and then you're kicked out of school and you have to go home. They call your parents and your parents have to leave work and you go home. That's a problem in a number of respects. One of them is you're not learning anything. Um, the other thing is you're, obviously it has a bad impact on the family and maybe the parents aren't home. So when you get sent out of school, it's just an opportunity for you to get in trouble because you're hanging out with your friends who are also kicked out of school or people in the community who are up to even worse things. And so the cycle just compounds. The other problem we see in the United States is there's also just an, ex uh, an escalation of discipline. So the, if you get excluded from school, if you get excluded or suspended, the odds are you're, you might get wrapped up with the criminal justice system or the more bad behavior you get into the school. The, now we have police officers in school. It's very common to have one police officer or more police officers who work only in the school. And some people think this is good because the police is a friendly face and whatever. It's not as bad as the police officers in the community. But when you have a police officer in the school, it's just another opportunity for the criminal justice system to be inserted into the school. So if you get in a fist fight in the school, there's already a police officer there who can arrest you, right? And so you might imagine that they might behave, police officers are like the rest of us. They might behave in a biased way. They might be more inclined to arrest the African-American students, of course, right? And this is called, in the United States, this is called uh, the school to prison pipeline. 
So the idea that, you know, basically the schools are structures in a way that, you know, students are already on their way to prison. You know, you get, you, you get wrapped up in the criminal justice, in the juvenile justice system. And once you're in the juvenile justice system, you're more likely to end up in the criminal justice system later. And so the schools aren't really getting you to career. The schools are directing you towards prison. Right? So part of this idea of having restorative justice in the school, having the problem resolved in the classroom, among the classmates, with the teachers, they keep the student in the classroom when something bad happens. So they continue to have the instruction so they learn how to behave better um, and that their education isn't disrupted. And it's not just one more path on the way to prison. You stay as part of the education system. Um, and then, of course, they have the sort of the highest tier, which I don't know as much about, but it's, you know, specialized, individualized intervention, you know, when something goes really wrong. So um, here's some, some more, like, diagrams. And um, I think this is a little bit simplistic. And actually, the reason why I like these diagrams is because they're, they're from an article from the National Teachers Union in the United States. And to me, this is really important because it shows that the teachers are bought into the system and the teachers like it because you're not going to have, because the teachers in this situation are the primary stakeholders and you're not going to have a dispute system that's going to work and stay over time if the teachers don't feel confident about it. So the, the reason I like this is it shows that the teachers find this system will work for them. So this is kind of like an abbreviated High, stylized story about what happened. So, you know, in the United States, for many years, we were wrapped up in this thing called zero tolerance. And zero tolerance is, you know, any infraction, you're out. Any infraction, like, we will, inf we will tolerate zero mistakes on your part. You make one mistake, you know, you're out, right? So the zero tolerance, which was very popular in the United States for a long time, there's a metal detector at school. You do something bad, you get detention. Police officer arrests you, then you're in juvenile detention, and now you have an arrest record. Right? This is the extreme version of the story. And then this is like the other sort of idealized version of restorative justice, which is, you know, there's no metal detector, people are happy to see you. If there's a problem, you discuss it together, and then you make up for, you know, by cleaning up or whatever to make the situation better. I mean, I think this is obviously very stylized and idealized, but I like that it suggests that. Teachers find it effective. Um, so this is, an, this is part of the related article, again, from the teachers union. And again, what I like about this is this is the teacher's story about why they like this process. Um, so this is a journalist wrote it, but so the restorative practices in the schools are called circles. So they're restorative circles. And they describe how they come in different forms. These circles can be, let's get to know each other daily or weekly to discuss potential disruptions. Or they're, they're held to address rumors or fights. Um, and so, you know, it's, they have very basic questions the teachers ask um, as part of this process. What happened? Who was affected? What can you do to fix it? Those are the three main questions in restorative processes. What happened? Who was affected? How can it be fixed? Um, and it's an educational process. So the other story I thought was so interesting was, um, you know, the students were being disruptive and they had a circle. And what happened was they, they told the teacher, the reason we're acting out is because we're restless because we've been sitting here all day. So part of the way of fixing it was the teacher gave them more opportunities to move around um, and, um, you know, signal when they could use music. So actually part of it involved an accommodation on the teacher's part, which I think is very unusual. And I think it's very interesting the teacher is describing this as success. Cause I think normally if, you know, at least, you know, if I was teaching a class and the students were being disruptive and they said, well, actually it's your fault because well, you didn't give us a break and it's 1039, which is un understandable. No, I'm just, well, we can't have a break or, you know, but anyways, it's just an example. Um, you know, if my students were like, oh, it's your fault that we're being disruptive, I'd be angry. So I like that this teacher is like, I like this process to help me improve the student's behavior. Um, do you want to break? I'm almost done. Should we have a break or should we almost? Right. I don't know. Wait, wait. Small break? Okay. 15 yeah. minutes? Okay. Sure. I've got time enough to read it. <laughs> yeah, so it's a small text. My assistant, like, I don't know. I, yeah, anyways.
I'm going to wait you to bring us some water. Joan went to bring us some water. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I brought water.
Yes.
Trip to Valparaíso. It's a, you have to, to go to, to Santiago and Santiago to take a transfer to Valparaíso. Oh I'm considering seriously the possibility of not traveling. Because <laughs> I, yes, very much traveling. situation is for having visiting scholars, visiting candidates. And some of them have visiting programs like one or four. You say San Diego, you say LA, you say LA. But you say visiting programs are campus. Oh, yes, yes. Center for Professional. Oh. Well, can I go in and visit the campus? Yeah. 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 Oh, to do academia. Yeah. 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 So one thing is that it's much easier to get like an administrative appointment than an academic appointment. So if you wanted to have a job like running an LLM program, where you're like in charge of the LLM program, you're in charge of recruiting students, managing students, interfacing with the professors, you're administrating the, the academic program, those are much easier to get than like the actual faculty positions. The faculty positions are more complex because you need to have like an American degree, maybe, like an SJD, maybe. But you already have a PhD. You already have an LM. I have an LM, but I'm not going to think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the market for academics in the United States is uh, through a process called the American AALS, American Association of Law Schools, and they have a process where you put in all of your information each year. This happens in like August of each year. You put in all of your your resume and all of your academic publications, um, 
and which courses you can teach in the United States, and you put all of it into the central system, and then any universities that are interested in interviewing you will call you back, and you go to a big conference in Washington, D.C. in like October, and you interview with the university you're all interested in. It's central <laughs> for academics. So that's the process. That's the process. Well, it depends. Like if they're hiring international law, or international law, or really call the time. whatever. It's, it's, search so, process. It's a search process. So it's very competitive. But yeah. I mean, what is your specialty? Oh, actually, my thing is about ODR. ODR. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. So ADR. Jobs are kind of hard to find. Well, one of the things that's going to be really complex for your situation is, um, you know, you would be limited to the universities that are in in, in California, in, in Northern California, and so there's only kind of a handful of universities. Um, it's not hard. I mean, yes, but that's not a good use of your skills. You can't like that. Why they do? But you know, can you get that restriction lifted on whether you can practice law in Brazil? Because that would, I mean, because I, I there may be like law firms in the United yes. States that are very interested in having an American or a, a, someone from Brazil to help them with Brazilian legal issues. So, if, so that would, I think that might be marketable if you can find a law firm that's very interested in. And expand or companies that are interested in expanding Brazil, or you can be a consultant where you work for many a legal consultant that works for many different firms advising you. Or you can, you know, there's also an opportunity to teach adjuncts, so you could teach. So even if you don't have a permanent faculty appointment, you could teach an individual course. So if you want to teach an individual course at, you know, University of Santa Clara or Stanford, um, what you do is you submit your resume to their pool. Each school has an individual pool, and you submit your resume. And if they want you to teach, they'll hire you to teach them a specific course. But it's not a permanent appointment. It's just like two or three years or one year of teaching a course for them. So if you had a consulting career where you're doing consulting for lots of different companies and teaching a course, like that might be nice. Um, there's no licensing system. So it's really just like building up a network of you know, people that know you and want to hire you. It's even this harder <laughs> to make a network. No, I mean, they take place all over the place. But you know, law firms often hire people. Law firms will hire a mediator to represent to mediate a specific legal dispute. Um, or, but there's also non-legal disputes maybe mediation. But it's those are very heavily dependent on network. network. But the, you know, the other option is like being a business person for like a large tech company. So for example, let's say that you have like a large tech company in Mountain View that wants to, that has a strong presence in Brazil. Like maybe Twitter is very big in Brazil, Twitter is very big in Brazil, Facebook. And they maybe they need somebody to help them handle disputes involving Brazil or what their policies would be in Brazil for when trouble comes up or resolving disputes, you know, and that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So maybe the large tech company that you're trying to expand in Brazil or has a large Brazil presence wants to hire you not for legal expertise, but ADR expertise or business expertise at handling whatever business problems or social problems they associate with doing work in Brazil or advice. So you could, even if, you're, if you can't practice law, but you have general expertise on business management, you could be hired as a business person in one of these companies. And they have more and more issues around disputes and how to handle, you know, so that's another option too, and that might actually be the most interesting job. Yes. I was just thinking about which skills do I have to do for the next year. Yeah. I think I was maybe more not skills but networking. Yeah. I think I networking think is way more important more. at this point because you have a lot of skills. I would say networking in Brazil, so you have a lot of contacts in Brazil who work in America, so that yeah. Yes, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. We start. Sure, I'm almost done. Actually. Okay. This is this oh, sorry. Story. I just, I just considered the possibility because I thought so many things to, to so read. Wanna, 
Oh, no, yeah. uh, no, I already. No, no, because uh, you mentioned some um, comparative uh, empirical measures. Uh, what the source of this? Um, the other slide. But it's this is the this is this the one? paper that I'm this is the paper that I'm citing. It's the one. This yeah, one? that one. Yes, sir, uh -huh. it's really small. I, Okay, we're starting, Professor Lise. Hello, welcome back. Um, okay, so this is a story from a teacher saying how that worked in her classroom. Um, this is a picture from the article of a student in a classroom. I, I think this is, maybe it's either an actual restorative justice circle with the students talking, or it might be a reenactment of a restorative justice circle for the journalist who was taking the picture. Um, I'm not sure, but you know, you can see they are describing their experience and then working out their problems. Okay, so the last stage of the dispute system design process is implementation and evaluation, which um, in my view, implementation will be easier if you've put more investment on the front end to make sure that this is a process that your stakeholders like. It is. It is more common to have very bad implementation issues if you have not designed your system very well and so you haven't anticipated how people will use it. You don't have an understanding of how people use existing systems or what they want. If you don't know those things, obviously you're gonna have a lot of implementation problems, but that's often a sign that your design was faulty. Um, but I, I think it is still important to gather data um, once you implement it to see how it's working and uh, look to how to adapt and change it over time. Um, you know, and again, I think the best systems also address the outside systemic forces that are um, limiting what's, what you're able to accomplish. So ideally, if you were trying to manage um, this problem in the schools is, or this problem in the schools with all of the barriers and stuff, I mean, ideally you would address the federal laws that are forcing schools or rewarding schools for putting up lots of gates and security that makes things worse for students. Um, ideally, you're addressing all of the regulations that might force teachers to cover all this material and leaves no time for anything else, or that might permit or give space or allow them to spend some time each day on these restorative practices or give them the choice to spend some time on these restorative practices. But thinking about, about working on the systemic factors that are limiting or interfering with how your system might work successfully. Um, and also, you know, again, in the design, asking whether it provides enough opportunity for the people who are involved in your system to make choices along the way, rather than forcing them to do something specific in your process. Does it give autonomy? Remember how we were talking about self-determination? Um, does it provide the people who are using your system with the kind of self-determination and flexibility and decision-making power that they would need to feel happy with the system and feel like the system meets their needs? Um, and then, of course, if you're using a Kaizen type approach, part of the evaluation system is, um, are you capturing the improvements made by the people who are on the ground. So maybe there is a teacher who's doing something really great that you haven't even thought of that could be used across the system or advise for or give advice or information to other teachers about this really great idea that a teacher used. So do you have a system for the people who are using um, your process to provide feedback and for innovation to spread so that your system gets better and better over time rather than worse and worse or just stays the same and doesn't adapt to teachers' new interests or needs or concerns. Okay, so we talked a little bit about that. Any questions or comments? So the evaluation, it's a continuous system of evaluation. You keep um, yes, I mean, this is the difficult thing because Americans don't really like this part of it. Americans are very enamored with, 
I will design you this great process and here it is and they go away and they work on something else. And it's, I think one of the, at least one of the points that the Kaizen book makes is that Americans aren't very excited about this marginal continual systemic improvements over time. And that it sort of advises people who are running the system to be more interested in the implementation and evaluation and improvement than they are now. Um, you know, the stereotype about the American approach is you like to disrupt, like sort of disruptive technology. This is our, this is what Americans do the best is having technology that disrupts an entire market. But um, Schumpeterian paradigm. Yeah, right. <laughs> But um, maybe we're not as good at improvement, although that's less and less true, especially in the technology sector. So the culture in the technology sector is to release a minimum viable product, to release a bad product, or not bad, but new product that's not perfect, and test it out, test it out in different ways, and then using the data that you gather, improve it and improve it over time. So American business is actually you know, coming closer to you know, the idea of staying with a project and continuing to improve it over time. So maybe the stereotype is not as true as it used to be. But I think we also need to, you know, in the ADR community, we also need to be starting to focus more on implementation and valuation as part of the process rather than just, you know, a box that you check at the very end. Other questions? Okay, so my last question for you is remember this process we were talking about with the mediation that doesn't fix the problem or only fixes the problem to a very minor extent because you still have to either pay the entire debt or go to the judge and pay the entire debt. Um, what, what are your ideas for how you could design a system for this problem that might work better? So maybe talk in your groups and then we'll talk as a big group. Diagnostic problems of the existing system you already have. Have problems. You want to fix them? Is, is there any right that you can see that it's like indisputable non waveable yes yeah, non wave yes wage and cleans in california are non waveable for example um it depends on whether it's pre dispute or post dispute so like there are a lot of claims that are like not really waveable before they happen but once they already arise and if you're in a legal dispute over them they become waveable you just can't wait them ahead of time. Yeah. So, but um, wage and hour claims in California, like if you weren't paid what you were owed, they're not waivable. Like you can't settle for any amount less than what you're owed. So those are fully non-waivable. Uh, I can help you find it. It's, it's statute. Mm -hmm. I can help you find it. California, I think it's really 
Yes. 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 They, they are kind of physiological. They're getting to you, right? They're getting closer. They have, they bolts, yes. They have a lot of yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of states have labor codes, but California is becoming increasingly complex. Um, and in, actually, in California, it's a misdemeanor to ask somebody to waive a, a wage and hour claim. So it's criminal. It's not really ever enforced, but it's criminal. It's theoretically criminal to ask them to waive it. It's so interesting to write about this. Yeah, there may be people who are writing about it too, but yeah. Even if it's not like so effective, yeah. it's interesting to Yes, it is really this. interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you could probably talk to the California labor commissioners who implemented it too. And I can, we can talk on WhatsApp and I'll help you put you in touch or email and I can put you in touch with resources. It's, I think it's very interesting. Are you planning to vote in Massachusetts? I don't think so. I will let you know if I am, but you can always come to Oregon. Uh, thank you very much. But just because we have the Brazilian Studies Association mm -hmm. and be really interested oh, yeah. in speak. Yeah, yeah. Talk or, okay. Because now that you visited Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, that is so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great privilege. Yes. Because you can really compare. Yes. yes. Well, we, could, we should collaborate. We can collaborate on some projects. Yeah. And I think that next year, maybe we'll make the Brazil Museum project. But people are coming like in August and September. Mm -hmm. And we will discuss it and okay. try to organize it. So okay. 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 Cool. Okay, should we ask them? Have they had enough time to talk? Do you want to give them more time? Okay. Some of them were checking email. I guess some of them are still talking. Oh. Some people go to the term translator app. Oh, Google, 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 Google Translate. The precise idea, the mm. notion, the meaning of the words. Mm. Okay. Very often. They are very, this is how American students spend a lot of their time in group discussion and then everyone talks together. I'm turning your class into an American class. <laughs> Oh, because they're so big. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like this. This is way. Yeah. 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 No, 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 no. I know. I, I set this up like this. This is good. Also, my handwriting is very bad. My students complain. Terrible. It even get getting worse because uh, well, we don't practice. Take a look at this. Oh yes. Okay. You might be as bad as me. <laughs> yes. Sure. Should we ask them now? Yes. Okay. okay. I am very eager to hear your thoughts. Please share your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm hmm Yes. Mm hmm Yes. Good. Great. Yep. Other thoughts? Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Other ideas? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm hmm mm hmm mm. yes 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 Yes. So part of it might be um, fixing the rules around insurance or health care payments. But also, you, you also make another important point, which is there's an important stakeholder missing from this particular dispute, which is the insurance company, if there's an insurance company. And if they're the ones who are at fault for this, there's no ability for this particular dispute resolution system to um, force the insurance company to pay. So so that's, that's another aspect for is addressing a missing stakeholder. Um, you know, providing better legal information as the other groups described, either through a lawyer or for, through some sort of legal information service, or maybe the information they send you when the lawsuit is first filed and that the system automatically forwards information to the parties about what their legal rights are, um, or checking, fixing the underlying legal rules. Other groups? Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. 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 Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. Mm hmm. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So having more pre-dispute options. Pre -dispute. And you know, going back to the insurance company, maybe providing better options for the consumers at the first stage when it's billed, like obligating the hospital to, I mean, obviously hospitals actually make quite a bit of efforts to collect the money, but obligating the insurance plus the hospital company to engage in a process, there are some very arcane rules around that, but having more pre dispute options for talking to the insurance company and the hospital together before it gets sent to a debt collector, at which point it becomes 
very difficult to deal with the debt because the hospital doesn't own the debt anymore. It's just the debt collector who doesn't care about the insurance company. Um, yeah, so a pre, more pre-dispute options. Yes. Yes, I do remember Owen Fizz, yes. <laughs> Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So some states say that you cannot use the small claims court system if you are a debt collector. They just say small claims court is not an option for you. You may not use it. Small claims court is for individual people that bring claims, not for debt collections. And it's just simply not a remedy available in some states. So that's, that's one approach that some states have taken to fixing this problem is they just take that away from dispute resolution. Are there ideas? Mm-hmm. Yep. There's also a private dispute resolution process um, in the United States called the Better Biz Business Bureau. And they are a nonprofit organization that regulates abusive consumer practices in a private way. So if you feel like you've been mistreated as a consumer, you can complain to the business, Better Business Bureau and they have a lot of influence over business reputations. And so you can complain to them and they can have a process um, to assess whether the practice was abusive. And that can, that can be a strong motivation for companies um, the uh, states also have something called the state attorney general, and they will sometimes bring lawsuits for abusive consumer practices. Um, but the problem is the state's attorney general just don't have very much resources and they just can't address every problem. So there are just so many abusive consumer practices that are not um, addressed, you know, including this problem of debt collection. You know, of course, the, the big solution that, that you hear for this type of problem, of course, especially for medical debt, is to fix the medical insurance system in general, because some of this story is just a symptom of all of the problems in the American system from these, you know, many different payers and the private billing and all of this is, so some people would say, well, what you need to do is provide better public options for healthcare. And that would actually, at least for medical debt, it would help with this problem. Um, when we think about the solution to this problem, I think some of what the ADR community needs to do is rethink some of these principles that we have a very strong attachment to almost as like a religious attachment in, the, in ADR, which is mediation always must have self-determination, always must have neutrality, always must be confidential. But you know, if you wanted to revisit that, maybe you shouldn't have self-determination for some sorts of cases. So maybe if your case involved bankruptcy, or a statute of limitations, or interest rate above the permissible amount, maybe those cases shouldn't be allowed to go to mediation and you shouldn't have the choice. I think some of the groups actually recommend it. You shouldn't have the choice to go to mediation because it's not a meaningful choice anyways. And that these certain types of cases where there is a good legal defense should be routed out of the mediation system and go straight to a judge to assess the validity of, the, the, of that defense. Um, 
you know, if you wanted to revisit the question of neutrality, you could have a system where the mediator provides legal information to the consumers. It's not as neutral because they're not exactly in the middle. They're providing legal information to the consumers, but that might address some of the problems within the mediation. Um, but that would be, you know, in general, very inconsistent with how Americans view ADR for the most part. Another option would be to revisit the question of confidentiality and maybe to have better tracking of court systems or better reporting from the mediator to the court system or to regulators, reporting to regulators about what they're observing. And that actually would be um, extremely problematic for ADR scholars and actually would also be a problem because of mediator confidentiality statutes in Oregon, which preclude a mediator from disclosing information unless it involved child abuse or elder abuse. But you know, maybe a better system would be like that Japanese arbitration system where the mediator reports out the trends they're observing so that we can track what the problems are and fix the abusive consumer practices that are revealed through the trends in mediation. And then of course there are other ways that we already talked about for addressing the systemic problems that are leading to this, like providing more education to judges about consumer law, providing more education to consumers, placing restrictions and burdens of proof on the debt collection company. So you have a burden of proof in terms of evidence, just like you know the Japanese insurance companies have to prove that you understood the contract here. You could say the debt collectors have to prove up that the debt is owed. They have to show all of the paperwork, better consumer protection laws, better legal aid, um, better restrictions on the underlying debt, healthcare reform. Okay, so that's all I have for today. So I'm happy to answer questions or comments from anybody. Questions? Oh, I, I have a... Also, it, it, and one of the things I didn't put on the slide was providing better uh, legal training to the mediators because, you know, the mediators very rarely have any knowledge of consumer law and that's a real impediment. And so, but part of it is changing the culture of the idea that the mediator should be informed and that the mediator can inform and the mediator can say, is knowledgeable enough to say no. Um, and those things are actually in many respects very inconsistent with, with ADR culture in the United States. But I, yeah, I think we could change that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yes. So you know what is so funny about ADR scholarship in the United States is that particular critique is very common in the arbitration setting. And one of the biggest critique of arbitration in the United States is that scholars can't do research on what are the types of claims, what are the outcomes, and, there, and, and so actually the American Arbitration Association is providing better information and better tracking for that reason. 
But one of the so strange things is you do not see that critique when it comes to mediation. Even though it's exactly the same problem, exactly the same systemic concerns, um, there is a feeling in, in the ADR community in the US that mediation is a black box and it doesn't work if you let anything out of the black box. And they are much more willing in mediation to accept the fact that we will never know what happened. And so it's very strange, the gap between a arbitration scholarship and mediation scholarship. Yeah. Sometimes settlement agreements are filed with the court. So you can maybe get it then, maybe. But that's it. It's crazy. I mean, the idea, I mean, the idea in ADR is just, oh, to include the researcher? Yeah. Maybe. But you'd have to, how would you do that? It's, it's not scalable. Uh, for instance, Pedro, Pedro is uh, researching the mediation of the state. Yeah. Yes, and uh, it was supposed to to, to sign a, a confidentiality uh, compromise. You could, but it's not scalable. You have to do like each mediation one at a time. I mean, yeah. you have to spend your whole life like asking for consent and looking at one mediation after it's, it's not very efficient way to do research. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's, I think it's a cultural, also just a cultural, cultural thing. Yes. It's a yes. Point. Yeah. Yes. Point. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Same thing. Yes. That's true. Yes. So if it's outside of the court system entirely, there's really no way to know what's happening. That's true. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, you have a little bit of that, but it, it ends up being kind of anecdotal evidence. So we have some of that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, would you say that ADR is making like a revolution in the American legal education? Because oh. I see so many seminars, so many symposiums on ADR, like almost every day. And here, I think there is a strong impact and we are changing, but like really slowly. And uh, we should insert some uh, compulsory courses about mediation, conciliation, it's important. But I see uh, maybe, uh, I, I'm not sure if I could say it's a, a kind of revolution, but I think there is a, a really strong impact on the American legal education. Okay, so this is a difficult story. Um, ADR has been really institutionalized in American legal education. So in any law school that you go to, there will be courses on negotiation. There will be courses on mediation. And you know, if it's a, if it's a university that really specializes in ADR, they'll have additional advanced courses like in dispute systems design or mediation advocacy. And so it has been institutionalized in American legal education. Um, but one of the problems or challenges in the American system is because ADR is now institutionalized, there is less demand for ADR expertise in the sense that everybody thinks they know, everybody is an expert now because everybody took negotiation in law school, so everyone's an expert. And so, um, you know, American law schools are not as interested in hiring professors in ADR because they think everybody knows it and it's not specialized, it's not cutting edge. It was very cutting edge and like, the 1980s and 1970s, and now it's, you know, it's not the new exciting thing anymore. People are more excited in like data mining, artificial intelligence, or, you know, these other 
questions. And so um, there is also respect in which ADR is a little bit stagnant in the United States because people feel like, you know, it's already here. It's already part of our legal system. Everybody is familiar with it. It's not new and exciting anymore. And sorry to ask you that. And I was not here on Monday, so let me ask you. Uh, because especially in employment issues, uh, sometimes ADR uh, is a kind of killing really important uh, ways uh, of effectiving some rights uh, as waivers of class oh, actions. Waivers, yeah. And mm -hmm. like arbitration clauses mm -hmm. uh, working. Uh, as waivers for mm -hmm. class acts yes. for class actions, yes. which are really important, really important instruments for yes. effectiving like some labor and employment rights. Mm -hmm. And how do you see and how do you see the way the Supreme Court is acting on this issue? <laughs> yes, I bored everybody yesterday with a very long discussion of that, and also on Monday. So I think. <laughs> Sorry, I was not here. Yes. Time. No. Yes. Uh, so. I think the Supreme Court is not going to change its mind about arbitration. So, but I think it is possible Congress is fed up and then you will see, eventually I think you will see the Congress amend the Federal Arbitration Act. The one thing that it, I think is a little bit concerning to me about efforts to reform the Federal Arbitration Act is sometimes what you're seeing is proposed bills that create a really small exemption to the Federal Arbitration Act. So following me too, there have been a, not a lot of proposed bills that says, well, claims for sexual harassment, maybe those shouldn't be covered by the Federal Arbitration Act. And that's good, but it's only a thin slice of the sorts of claims that might end up in arbitration. So, you know, sexual harassment cases are not very good to bring as a class action because they're cla there are practical limits on how many people one person can harass. So, there, it's not common to have a class action for harassment. So including an exclusion in the FAA for harassment, that's not a big concession to companies. You know, What really matters is wage and hour claims and discrimination claims. Those are the ones that get brought as class actions. And those are the ones that would still be covered by the FAA, even if you pass legislation for Me Too with a carve out for harassment. But for example, uh, the Walmart case, uh, yes. three employees like represented one million, one and a half million employees. Yes. And it was about gender inequality. Yes. And yes. do you think it's possible again to happen a kind of Walmart case? Because with oh, the class sure. action yeah. waiver, is it possible to have a, a, a Walmart case again? Yes. Okay. So um, in 2000 and... 11 or 2012, there was a very famous case called Dukes v. Walmart, um, as you know, where um, essentially three plaintiffs represented all of the employees at Walmart or a very large proportion of employees at Walmart for gender discrimination and maybe race discrimination as well. Um, but what happened was the Supreme Court said, no, that class, that class action is too large. And we're not going to certify that as a class action. It's too big. These people don't have every, anything in common because you're including everyone in the whole country. And maybe discrimination is different in different places. We don't like this. And so when that case came out, many scholars, including me, um, wrote a lot, lots of long articles about the Dukes v. Walmart case and how that was going to change everything. And we thought that was the big problem was Dukes v. Walmart. But it turns out it wasn't Dukes v. Walmart. It was the Supreme Court decisions about arbitration that killed the class actions. And so um, it was arbitration that made those class actions disappear. So even if you roll back arbitration, you do still have some limits on class actions, but it's better than having no class actions. <laughs> Close the session today? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Yes, sure. Yes.